I'm really happy to be here with you. Um, I'm going to talk, <laughs> talk about the Last Judgment. Hopefully, I can make it cheerful. Uh, <laughs> This is Jonathan Peugeot. Welcome to the Symbolic World. Um, the reason why I wanted to talk about The Last Judgment is because, um, first of all, it's one of my favorite icons. And it's one of my favorite icons because just like The Last Judgment, or just like the end, just like the... the uh, that moment where everything comes together at the end. The icon of the Last Judgment is actually an amazing synthesis of all of iconography. And in the icon of the Last Judgment, we find all elements you'll see as we kind of move through it. We find elements and structures which are in all our icons, but brought together into this one kind of gigantic uh, icon moment. And so it's a, it's, it's a good way to kind of understand also what iconography is working towards. One of the things that's important to understand is that the early church, and even today, the church, even the building of the church, the way that it was conceived, is based on the last judgment. So the early churches, even if you go to Rome and you see some of the early churches, you'll see that what's represented is this eschatological moment, right? So for those who don't know, es eschatology is this coming, this coming of the last thing, this coming return of Christ, but also that moment where everything is going to become clear and everything will be revealed in its totality. And so the church was made that way. The, the, the early Christians, things were, it's a bit, it was a bit complicated the way they were set up. It's a bit different from now, but they would... The, 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 um, the Christ that we see here in the dome of the church is the returning Christ. Right? It is Christ who is returning. And so to understand the icon of the Last Judgment is also to understand the, the kind of the to total visual tradition that the church has given us. As much the, the sacred space as the way that the images have been laid out in the sacred space. Because it's not, it's, nothing is, is arbitrary, okay? And so we're going to look at the icon of the Last Judgment. I'm going to just kind of work through it, and I'm going to try to help you see how it's connected to the other icons, and hopefully how it ultimately connects to our own life, and to that it is actually not just an image of this cosmic moment of, of finality, but it also shows us the very process by which we attain to that moment, the very process by which we can enter into the resurrection. All right, so <laughs> the way that the icon is built, you have to see it kind of in two ways. You see it from the, the top to the bottom, so there's a vertical reading of the icon, and then there's left to right, okay? So if you look at it, you can see that I chose this one particularly because it's very clear. There's like a line that goes straight down the middle of the icon, which separates it from, uh, with, with the left hand and the right hand of Christ. Okay? And then there's also different tiers of the icon, which represent the, this vertical reading. Okay? So the first element we need to look at, of course, is the central element, the one that pulls our eye in, that kind of brings us, the first thing that we notice as we look at it is, of course, Christ who's there at the top of the icon and who is represented as this returning Christ, the Christ in glory. And like I said, this image of Christ is also the image of Christ in the dome of the church. It's Christ in glory who is returning in that final moment. But it's not just, how can I say this? It's also Christ in every icon. <laughs> that is, the way that Christ is represented in our iconography, the fact that he's, if you look at Christ, he's 
not 100%, but in so many icons, he's represented wearing this, this vestment, which is the, a Roman vestment of a senator. So a, a, a vestment of a, of a, of a high-ranking person. You know? Ultimately, it becomes this notion that, that Christ is like the king. Christ is like the emperor. Christ is this high figure. And so that's how we represent Christ in the icon. Because Christ, obviously, in the first century, did not go around uh, Galilee wearing a, a, a clavis, which is this, this sign of, of Roman nobility, you know, with, a, with a, a very fancy Roman dress. That's not how Christ physically dressed. Uh, obviously not. But the reason why we represent Christ that way is because we're always looking towards that eschatological moment. We're always trying to show what all of this is leading us to. And what it's leading us to is this moment where everything will become clear and Christ will return in glory. And so if you look at the images that you have even in your parish, you know, if you see Christ raising Lazarus, or if you see him at the resurrection, you'll notice that he's always dressed as, as he's always presented as this glorious Christ, okay? Um, and so Christ is sitting on a rainbow. And he, he is returning. You can see the same image right there. If you look at it over here, it's the same way that he's represented at the ascension. And the reason for that is, technically, it's because that's what they said. The angel said, you know, just like he went up, you know, that the same way he's going to return. But it also helps us to understand that in the icon of the Last Judgment, this image of the ascension is also brought into this image. It's brought into it. And the way that the ascension is represented shows us these two, these two tiers. And so we have Christ who's ascending as the head of the church. And then under, we have the church itself, which is represented, first of all, as the mother of God in the center, and then the apostles that are on the side. And so you have these two tiers. You have the head, and you have the body. And so the ascension, that image, it could almost be the return of Christ, because that's also how Christ returns. He, this, he, he, he's going to come back and, and, and manifest the unity of the head and the body, the total unity of the head and the body. All right. And so next to Christ is the Theotokos, the mother of God, on his right, and then St. John the Baptist on his left. Then to the, uh, continuing on that side, you have St. Peter, who's on the right of the mother of God, you have St. Paul, who's on the left of St. John the Baptist. That's what we call a deusis, okay? So the deusis is the basic pattern of all, once again, of all of iconography. Christ in the center, flanked by different saints in a sort of hierarchy, usually the mother of God to his right, St. John the Baptist to his left. You see that often, you'll see it in... An iconostasis, for example. Okay? And so in the iconostasis, it's not, it's not hundred, it doesn't have to be hundred percent this way, but often in your iconostasis you have that as well. To the right of Christ is his mother, but then often in the iconostasis we'll have to his left, there will be there will be St. John the Baptist. Okay. And why do we why do we why do we have those two? Right? Why do we have those two? Because those two are the ones who pointed to Christ. They're the ones who said, this one, right? his mother, by, by bearing him, and St. John the, the, the Baptist as also, um, as also coming before him. But there's more than that. There's more than that. Okay? And already we're going to start to see this other separation of the icon between the right hand and the left hand. And so, of course, we know when we, when we have the right hand and the left hand, we, we think immediately of the parable of, of Christ and the sheep and the goat. So this is actually, 
one of the earliest images of the Last Judgment. Okay? This is a 6th century image from, from Ravenna. And here it's very simple, right? There's Christ in the center, and then there are the sheep to his right, and the goats to his left. And there's St. Michael on his right, and Gabriel to his left. Okay? Let me go back here. And this is going to, it's going to be the first sign to help us understand that this is really a cosmic image. Because we're t we tend to think of the right hand of Christ as good and the left hand of Christ as bad. But it's not necessarily so, right? There, is, there, are, there are positive aspects to the left hand of Christ as well. And we see those in St. John the Baptist. In St. In John the Forerunner, we see the, what I would call the positive aspect of the left hand. Okay. And so Christ, what does Christ say to the sheep and the goats? He says to the sheep and the goats, he says to the sheep, come, right, come in, come, come into the kingdom. And he says to the goats, move away, right, move away. Now, that is what we see. The mother of God is everything that is the right hand in the positive aspect of the right hand. She is covered, right? She is brought, she is, she is, she's, a, she's hidden, right? She's inside. She's, she is an image of this bringing in. And that's what she did to Christ. She gathered humanity in her womb so that it could receive God, you know, in her womb. And so that is this gathering. And the mother of God is almost always has this, all this whole notion of gathering. And we, even in our own interaction with her, that is how we see her, as this mother that gathers in, okay? And then the St. John the Forerunner, he is the wild man. And so he is that, he's the very opposite. She is closed, hidden. She, she, she is completely covered. And he's wild and his hair is crazy and he's, he's, he's wearing sheepskins and, you know, he's living out into the desert and he's screaming to everybody, repent, repent, repent. And the mother of God, she's in secret, she's in silent, and, 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 and we encounter her in that silence and in that secret, okay? And so we already have this right hand and left hand, but it, like I said, it doesn't, it's not necessarily negative. And then if we move just a little bit further, we see St. Peter, on the right of Christ, okay? St. Peter, who's that foundation, who's that rock, okay? The imagery of, of, of St. Peter is that, that image of the, of the foundation, right? He's the apostle to the Jews, so he's this, this rock and the apostle to those that are the inside. Those, teach those that are on the inside, and who's on the other side, right? It's the apostle Paul. Who's the Apostle Paul? First of all, he was a, strangely a Roman, a Roman citizen, and he was the Apostle to the Gentiles. He's the kind of somewhat legitimate, you know, Apostle, the 13th Apostle. He, you know, he, he, he comes on the fly, he, you know, and, and then he goes out to the world and he preaches to everybody. Okay. So you have this image of this moving out, but this image of the moving out is, is a positive image at, at the beginning, right? It's not all... It's, all, it's not just positive and negative in terms of, of morality. It's really, it's really a cosmic structure. It's the, it's the structure of reality. This is what we're looking at, okay? It's the way that the world works, okay? And so now let's follow the central... Oh, one of the reasons... Okay, so the reason why Christ is sitting on a rainbow is, is because he is sitting on the heavens. There is a, a text in the Psalms where it says that God is sitting on, the, that the, the heavens are his throne and the earth is his footstool. And so here is Christ showing us that he is divine and then sitting on the heavens. And the rainbow is obviously a symbol of heaven because it is that dome, right? It's that arch that we can see, but it's also a bridge, right? It's also this bridge which connects heaven and earth. And so we get all of that in this image of Christ sitting on the rainbow. It's a very ancient, ancient image. <coughs> All right, so as we move now down the line, we have an image which is called the Hetimasia. Okay? Can you see it? It's that, that weird square right here. Okay, so that weird square with the cross 
and uh, the two angels, that's, it's called the Hetimasiya. And what it is, it's the prepared throne. It's the throne that is prepared for the return of Christ. Now, you could, you have it, like I said, you could take that image of the ascension, and it's the same thing. Right? So we don't show, in this, this, we don't show the mother of God there, but we show a throne. And the mother of God is, is Christ's throne. It's another vision of the church which is preparing itself which is laying itself out, it's preparing itself to receive its king. Its king. And so the church is, is, is that's what the, the notion of the empty, the empty seat represents. It's a very ancient image, and it's very interesting because it actually um, can help us understand a little bit of how the church, uh, some of the, the difficulties that were present, present at the beginning of the church, because the, the, the idea of the Heti Messia was present, started at the Nicene, the Nicene Council. At the Nicene Council, when Constantine couldn't be there, they left this throne, which was empty. And this empty throne represented the power of, of the, the emperor in his absence. And a lot of the fathers were not so, so keen on that. They kind of, you know, I don't know. They, they, they weren't so keen on, on having that type of imagery. And so right away at Constantinople, at the next council, right away, they did the same thing, but instead they put a book of the gospel on the throne. And so it became, rather than being an image of an empty seat prepared for the emperor in his absence, it became an empty seat prepared for Christ in his absence. And there are many, there are many, many scholars until now who believe that that throne, the, the, the bishop's throne that used to be in the apse of the church, at the end of the, of the apse of the church, was at first a throne that was left empty. Because it was the throne that was prepared for the return of Christ. The whole liturgy was based on this idea that we are waiting for the returning Christ. And the throne is here prepared so that Christ can sit in his throne. Right? But, it's mo but it, most importantly for us, it's really to understand what the church, what the role of the church is, right? What it is that we have to do, even in our own lives, the idea of preparing the throne. I mean, that's, that's what we need to do in ourselves. We need to prepare ourselves. We need to work on laying, laying things out properly, preparing the, the, the body into which Christ is joined to, okay? And so that's, that's our work. And it follows down in the, in the middle, of the, uh, of the um, and then of course, there's, there's the cross that is there on the, the, the throne, and the cross acts as this balance. There's a, I don't know if you have this troparian, but there's a troparian in the Russian tradition which says, your cross, O Christ, is like a balance, right? For the thief, on the, 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 the thief who looked at you was raised up, and the thief that, that, that didn't was cast down. So the cross already, is an image of the last judgment. In the cross itself is already this, everything is accomplished in the cross. So we have this balance, this central axis which goes down, which separates the left and the right hand side. Right? And that's what the cross acts as that, as that uh, image. Then we have the two angels. And the two angels, it's very fascinating. I, this part, I don't totally understand this part. Uh, and I'll explain why. Look at the two angels, the red and the blue angel. So this is really, this is, this is a sixth century image. Okay? Um, and the red angel is on the right hand of Christ. You think it's St. Michael. And then the blue angel is on the left hand of Christ. I don't totally understand it. And here, they flipped it. Okay? If you look at an iconostasis, often you will have an image of St. Michael on the right hand hand side, you have one. But often on the other side, you'll have an image of St. Gabriel. It doesn't have to be an image of, of Gabriel, but it often it will be an image of Gabriel. But, so it, that structure, like I told you, that basic, basic structure has been there from the beginning. It just, it just seems that sometimes the two angels seem to, to, to flip on each side. But this, very, this, this kind of cosmic structure is there in the way the iconostasis laid, is laid out. It's there the way with the, with the dome. Everything is, is totally... Uh, coherent, 
in the way that it's set up. And so now moving down from the, uh, the Hetimasiya, then we have the angel which is holding the scales. And so the scale itself, like the cross, right, it's this straight line which goes down and depending on what side, which way things are going to go. Okay? Um, and it's represented as this angel on the right side and the demon on the left side. Right? And this image, everybody has seen this image before, this, this image. It's, it, you see it in, you know, when you were young, you saw these cartoons and there was an angel on the right shoulder and the devil on the left shoulder. Right? That's that right there. It's the same thing. It's the same image, okay? It is this possibility that we have, right, that, that we have in ourselves. St. Gregory of Nyssa goes as far as saying that God has appointed for each person an angel which encourages us towards, towards heaven and a corrupter which, which tempts us and brings us down, okay? And so this, this is a very ancient tradition, this idea of that, that there are these two sides. Homer Simpson didn't make it up. Like, it really is this very, very ancient idea of this, these two possibilities within us, right? These, these two possibilities of either giving in to our passions, to that which divides us, that which pulls us apart and it brings us down, or else giving in to... To, not giving in, <laughs> sadly we wish it would be that simple, but submitting ourselves to the higher virtues, to love, to charity, you know, to compassion, and then being able to, to, to move up. And so the, in this image, this is the judgment itself. And so the soul is being judged of the person. It's being judged whether it has, it has been pulled down or whether it has gone up. And you see this... I think I have an image of it. All right, so here's a good image of it. So here you see um, the soul. Sometimes in the, uh, the, the image of the last judgment, you'll actually see the soul, which is standing in the middle, right, as this person who could go either way, like we can go either way, and then the angel that is putting in the, in the scroll the the, uh, the good things that the person has done, and then the demons that are trying to pull the scales down so that you go that way. And in this image, it's the hand of God uh, who is holding the, uh, the, the scale, and in his hand are the, the souls that are, that, are, that are to be judged. Let me just show you this. Okay. And so, and it's not just an image of the last judgment. This notion, this is the image of the, our life. It's the image of our daily life. Okay, this is an image of the divine ladder. And what it represents, it re represents the struggles of the person in their life uh, to ascend the ladder, to go up and encounter God, to, to reach the state of illumination and unity with God. And in that image, it is it is at the same time this image of a judgment. Or this, the same image that you saw with the angel on one side, you can see right here, here's the angel. And in this version, the angel is holding a crown. Sometimes you have the angel just encouraging the person to go up. And then on the other side, you have these demons that, are, that have these hooks that are trying to pull the people down into the mouth of death that's down there, into the mouth of hell. So that's really, you know, if you can leave with just one thing today, is to understand how the, limit, the image of the last judgment and the last judgment itself is something which is already happening now. It is not just something to wait for. It is, it is the very process of our, of our existence, which will, in the end, be full, will be fulfilled in, in the last judgment, but is, is, is already part of our, of our existence today. Yes? Climbing the ladder now? Yes, definitely, definitely. I mean, the Saint John Climacus wrote a book called. This is based on the book by by Saint John Climacus, which is the Ladder of Divine Ascent. And a lot of people during Lent they read this book. It's very hard to read. Don't 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 probably don't read it. At least don't read it without the guide of a spiritual father because it's really written for ascetics. 
But the principle of the book, or the principle of this notion that we are called to ascend, that we are called to encounter God and be united with God fully, totally, you know, as much as it's possible, as St. Maximus says, that that's, that's what we're called to do, right? And so the, the, the process of the resurrection is one that's happening now. You read it in the saints, you read it in, in the fathers, that, that we can already participate in the resurrection now. And, and when, we, when we take the sacrament, when we take the holy sacrament, we are already in that eschatological moment. That is probably one of the hardest things to understand. When we take the sacraments, when we, when we sing and we, we talk about that we are united with the cherubim, united with the angels, gathered together, right? And then we thank God for all, we thank God for all that he's done, for all that Christ has done, and then we name them, right? We heard it today. We, 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 the, the, I, I don't know it in English, but the, the, uh, the incarnation, the, the death, the resurrection, the ascension, and then, the last coming. And we even say, we thank you for that which has already been accomplished. Right? It, it, we are living, we, can, we have access to that eschatological moment already. Now, one of the aspects that we see in terms of the right and the left hand, which isn't in the first image that I showed you, but is often in the image of the last judgment, is we often have Adam and Eve, which are there, next to the throne of prepared judgment, Some, not necessarily always in the exact same place. So you have here Adam on the right of Christ, and then you have Eve on the left of Christ. Right? And so that also brings in to the last judgment the image of the anastasis, the image of the resurrection. So the, in the image of the resurrection, we have Christ that goes down and brings up Adam and Eve you know, to their resurrection, it's very mysterious, to their resurrection, and here they are, right? Christ has brought them there. Here they are right now, you know, participating in the last judgment, participating in that moment, standing in for all of us, standing in for man and woman the, uh, as being the father and mother of all of us. Okay? So it, it's, and here in this image, it's very, it's, it's very interesting because, you see Christ on his left hand, he's holding a sword. Sometimes you'll have Christ with a, with a sword coming out of his mouth on, the, on, the, on his left side, depending. In our image, <clears throat> we have this scale, this balance, where Christ is raising up his right hand and lowering his left hand. Right? And if you want to understand what this means right here, a lot of people wonder, why the third bar of the Russian cross? Why is it tilted? Why is it slanted? Right? And that's, that's why. Because your cross, O Christ, is a balance. And there's that same gesture in the cross that you have Christ doing with his hands. And it's, it's very, you find it all over the place. This is, a, this is an image, this is the Florence Bapt Baptistry, right? This is, a Western, this is a Western image based on Eastern prototypes. But here, here you have Christ raising up his right hand, and then pushing away with his left hand. Right? And the same, he's sitting on a rainbow. He has his mother on his right side. He has St. John, the foreigner, on his left side. There's St. Peter. It's hard to see now. I don't know if that's St. Paul, though. Maybe it's St. Paul. But This is really, I mean, this is not just a, this is, a very, this is a, an image that has been built up in the church from the very beginning, right? From the very first structure of how the, the church is, is built. All right. So now, on the right side of Christ, we have the saints, right? That are, like he said in the... the, the uh, the, uh, the image of the sheep and the goats, the saints that are on his right side getting ready to be gathered in, to enter into the kingdom, to enter into his mercy. Below that, we have paradise. So paradise is down here. And can you tell what's going on here? Can someone guess what's going on here? No? 
So that is St. Peter. What is he doing? What does St. Peter have in his hands? He has got the keys. He's opening the door. He's opening the door to paradise. And, it, and, it's, and paradise is the Garden of Eden, people. A lot of, it's very, a lot of people struggle. They always think that when we die, we go to heaven. That is not a Christian understanding at all. We don't die and go to heaven. The, 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 the return to, the, to paradise really is that, that, that image of the new Jerusalem at the end of time. This joining, it's a joining of heaven and earth. It's a resurrection of the body. Right? It's not this disincarnated floating spirits, right? We, we, we will have a, it's mysterious, I don't know exactly what it means, but, but there is a, a, a resurrection of the body. And so on the door of paradise is the cherub that God put on at, at the gate of paradise to stop Adam and Eve from entering into paradise. But is that the only place where God put a cherub? At the gate of paradise? Where else is there a cherub at the limit of something, you know? So on the veil of the temple, before entering into the Holy of Holies, there were cherubs which were stitched into the veil. Okay? And so the cherub that's at the gate of the garden is also the cherub that is at the entering of the Holy of Holies. So to enter into paradise is to enter into the Holy of Holies, is to enter into that sacred place. It's to, 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 to ascend the mountain with Moses, to go up to the holy place. Okay? And so the entering into paradise is also entering into the holy place in the church. It is this, this encounter with the sacred. Okay? And so we have St. Peter... I don't know why St. Paul is there, but I think it's because St. Peter and St. Paul kind of ha always have to be together. You know, it's like the apostles to the Jews, apostles to the Gentiles, we need the right and the left hand. Um, you know, and this idea of the right and the left hand is there, you know, it's there, in, in, um, it's every, it's there everywhere. I want to show you an image of, uh, oh, here, I forgot to show you this image. This is an image of the, of the, the Council of Constantinople. And now you can see the Hechimazia in the back, the prepared throne with the book on it. And then all around are the fathers of the council. And now the king or the emperor is sitting to the side. He's not sitting in the middle. You know, and this prepared throne for Christ is the central, the central image. Um, but in the image of Pentecost, we have the same structure. We have the same structure. We have St. Peter on the right, St. Paul on the left. And in the image of Pentecost, also, we have the prepared throne, right? See that empty space between St. Peter and St. Paul? That space is prepared for Christ. Right? And so it's the, same, it's the same idea, it's the same concept. The image, the image of this empty space between the two is the same image as the Hetimessia. It's, it's, the, it's the prepared throne for Christ as he returns to join himself with his church, ultimately. Right. Okay. Now, in paradise, who's in paradise? Can you guess who the first person we encounter in paradise is? No? What has he got? Do you guys see? He's here. He's right here. What is he carrying? No? What is he carrying? He's carrying a cross. <laughs> who was, who? It's the good thief. Right? It's the good thief. And, and it's important to understand why we have the good thief there. Because I told you, the cross is where all was finished, where all was accomplished on the cross. And so the good thief becomes the image, becomes the image of all those who look to Christ. And Christ says, today you will be with me in paradise. Right? And it's, 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 true. It, it's true for everybody. Like today... You can be with me in paradise if you look to Christ. And so the good thief becomes this first image of this first image of what is happening on the cross and what is happening in the whole story of salvation. Okay? So that's why we have the good thief there. Someone said what the next one is. What's the next one? That's a weird one if you look at it. Can everybody see what's going on there? 
No. <laughs> show you, I'll show you an easier one to, to, to recognize. Wait, oh yeah, so this one, I'll tell you. So here's, here's, a, here's an easier one to recognize of this, of, the, of, what, of what's happening there on the right. Obviously, I'm not, on the left side, it's someone else. It is, yeah, it's Abraham. And he has on his lap Lazarus. Who said Lazarus? Someone said Lazarus. All right. <laughs> because, right? Because of the story that Christ told about, about those two places, about the right hand place and the left hand place. One of them was represented as Lazarus sitting in the bosom of Abraham, right? And one of them was represented as someone who was in the in the place of suffering. Now, in this version, and in many versions, it's not just Lazarus, but you see all these heads, these little heads in the, this cloth, right? And it's this gathering in of, of Israel into the bosom of Abraham. Now, what's important to understand is that these images that you see, all those images that are there, right, they're there for a reason. They're there to help you understand what paradise is, what is that, okay? And so the bosom of Abraham, that's an image of what paradise is. Right? It is this returning to your origin, going back into the, 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 the place out of where you came from, right? Going back to the garden, going back to Abraham, those are two images of the same thing. They're just at different levels. But this idea of going back into paradise, into the garden from which we came, from which we were dispersed, and going back into Abraham is the same thing, right? It's just, it's just, a, it's just slightly a different, a different version. And that's also why next to Abraham, who's next to Abraham? Am I hiding people? Right, so it's the mother of God. So the Theotokos is next to Abraham. Why? The same reason, right? She is paradise, okay? So the mother of God is paradise because she is the place where creation met its creator. She is the place where heaven and earth touched, just like paradise was this mountain where heaven and earth touched and Adam and Eve were at the top. So too, the mother of God is that place where heaven and earth touched. She is paradise. She's also the throne. She's all those images. She's the church. She's all those, those images of how we can come and encounter God, and we can receive God, you know, to the extent that it's possible. And that's why she, she is. So those images that you see, they're not just arbitrary things you put in there, but they are all images to help you understand what are we talking about when we talk about paradise, right? What are we talking about? So what is it? It's the church. I told you, it's an entry into the holy place. It's a, it's a, it, that's why we have those cherubim. Paradise and the church are, are the same. The mother of God and the church, this returning to our origins, this returning to the garden, all these images, when you start to lay them out and you start to, to see them next to each other, it can start to awaken Father talked about talked to us about the noose, and because we can't access the noose with our with our rational thinking, we can't access it. But these these types of images are there to awaken in us, you know, to connect things together and to awaken in us this this intuition. Okay, because obviously paradise is not. I'm not going to say this, but I mean, all these images are there to help us understand what what paradise is, you know, and we, we have to take them together. We can't just, we can't just separate them. All right, I hope that, I hope this is, this is important. All right, now, now we go to the, to the bad side, we go to the nasty side. All right, let's go to the left side. <laughs> All right, now, on the left side, first thing you notice is this crazy red river that flows out. <coughs> That flows out of the foot of Christ. Um, and uh, that, is, that, that comes from a vision in Daniel, in the book of Daniel, when, the, when uh, Daniel sees the Son of Man coming 
uh, he describes this river of fire which flows from, from, from his throne, you know, and, and uh, comes out. <coughs> Let's not talk about that for now. Let's talk about the top part first. So I'm sure that this image right here, that is probably some of the weirdest images you've ever seen. Um, what's going on up here, right here? So what if you, you, it's hard to see because the image is small. But what's happening is you have all these beasts that are spitting up people. Okay? So you have all these different monsters. Right? See that guy coming out of that sea monster's mouth? There's a guy coming out of the lion's mouth. Right? So all these monsters are spitting up people. And the same... For the fish, all these things. So like, what is that? What is that? <laughs> and then you have an angel who's blowing a trumpet. And so the angel is blowing the trumpet. It's, saying, you know, it's the angel of, 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 of Revelation, blowing the trumpet to call the dead to rise. And so the way that we show this is by showing these beasts that are giving up their their prey. Why do, we, why do we show it that way? Because this is also, I, I, I've been trying to show you that this is not just, this is an image of what's going on in you right now. It's not just an image, it is an image of the total final image of, of, of the cosmos, but it's also an image of what's happening in you right now. And so these beasts are the passions. They're, the, they're, our, they're these monsters. There are all these things that rip us apart, that, that tear us apart, that, that bring us down into death. And here are these beasts that are giving up. So you see, it's not just beasts. You see people coming out of their tombs as well. Right? So some people are coming out of their tombs, and then some people are coming out of these, of these different beasts. And so... It's all, it, it, that's the image in the church fathers of the animals, of this, this kind of animality, is always this image of the, the, the passions, right? The, the, when when uh, Adam and Eve fell, God gave them these garments of skins. Thanks. And it was this joining, it was this joining to our animal nature. And so, the, the animals that are giving up their dead is really an image, first of all, of how this image of death, that's what it is. It's an image of us being devoured. We all experience it. Everybody has that experience of being pulled down by your passions, whether you know, it could be your, your, you know, whether it's hunger, whether it's, uh, it's your sexual passions, whether it's pride, whether it's you know, avarice, all these passions, they pull us into death. Okay. And then, but it is also possible, I mean, it not only is it possible, but, but it is in, in the, it is possible for those to give up their dead at the, at the calling, right, of Christ. And we can enter into, come back from that, 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 that experience, okay? So it, there's, it's, it's, it's very interesting, it's very important to understand that, those two are kind of laid up against each other, right here and right here. Right? So here we have people being eaten by this beast. And then above it, we have people being given out, like being regurgitated. Like, and it, this is not arbitrary. I know, I know it's, some people might think it's arbitrary, but we have a very old image of this. Very, very old one. It's this one. <laughs> It's not, this is, there's reasons why these images are chosen, right? Because we know that the resurrection has already been represented as Jonah being spit out by the fish. That we're coming out of dead, death is coming out of this, this anim, animal uh, existence. It's, it's kind of ra raising ourselves up, you know. Uh, and so that's why, not only that's why the beasts are spitting up the people, but that's also why the, the head of the fish becomes an image of right, 
becomes an image of hell itself. Can you see that it's the same? So Jonah's, the image of Jonah's fish becomes this ultimate image of the mouth of Hades, the mouth of, the mouth of, of death. In the West, the image of the Anastasis, of the resurrection, let me find it. This is a Western image of the resurrection. Okay? And so in the East, we have this image here that you all see of Christ raising Adam and Eve out of this pit and out of the tombs. But in the West, it was always Christ raising people out of this mouth of death, right? this mouth of Hades. Okay? And, it's, and this image is there in the east, too. I showed it to you before. See? Down there. So there it is also in the image of the ascent. Right? Also to remind you that this is happening now. Right? This is not just, I mean, it is the ultimate image, but it's also one which engages us today. All right. I'm almost done. I'm almost done. <laughs> The possibility, yeah. Well, it, it, it has to do, I mean, I think it, it has to do with this notion of the left hand as being related to the wild, to the animal. It's also the desert. So you can see in the image, it's, it's, it's the wildness. So the wildness in, in, uh, in the Bible is represented as the desert, right? When the, the, the Israelites are lost in the desert. So you see this desert. But it's also the flood, right? It's also the waters. So you have these two images together. You have the image of the desert, the image of the flood. So it's this, it really is this image of the limits, right? The, 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 the it, different images of chaos, different images of, of the limits of, of what is ordered, OK? Um, and so that's why it's on the left-hand left side. But like I told you, the left-hand side is not just bad. It just is. It just it's just, it's just an aspect of reality, okay? But there is obviously the ultimate, uh, you know, the final image of the, of, the, of the final judgment of those who are eaten by the beast. Um, and we know that it's possible, right? I mean, we, we know that people can let themselves or fall so so deep that they are devoured. And fire is really the best image, image for that. Okay. But it's, it's important to understand that fire is not, fire is not just a, a bad thing. It's not just a negative thing. It's a, and there's, we have another fire, right? We have that fire right there. Okay. See, they have fire. And so fire is this multiplication. It's this division. It's this moving out. And so, the, the fire of the Holy Spirit that made people speak in languages uh, that everybody could understand, right? That's like St. Paul that moves out. So it's that left hand that moves out. Uh, but that also can be fragmentation. It could also be something that you lose all cohesion and it's ash. The only thing left is ash, okay? Uh, and so it's an image of this breakdown. Is there a way in which the left side is chaos and the right side is order? Um, there's a way that chaos can be tamed and, and... Well, yeah, there, it is slightly. I, I wouldn't limit it to that. I would say that the right side is really this bringing in, and then the left side is this kind of this breaking apart. But you could, you could use those terms. I mean, it wouldn't be totally... It wouldn't be totally uh, uh, but but there, is a, there is a negative right side, too. I'm not, I'm not talking about it here, but there is also a negative aspect of the right side. Has to do with, it has to do with St. Peter. St. Peter is the right hand of Christ, but he's the one who also is full of pride, right? So pride is the sin of the right hand. St. Maximus the Confessor said it explicitly that pride is the, pride and self, you know, self-sufficiency is, this, is a right hand sin, and then the passions, you know, drunkenness and prostitution, all those types of things, they are sins of the left hand. They're sins that dissipate. Um, but in the image of judgment, really, then finally, this is the final, the final image. And often, in the good images of the last judgment, you'll see kind of different categories of people that are, all, that are kind of in the fire. And so usually there'll be like, a, here we see there's a king. Often there'll be kings. There'll be, usually we put the kings and the bishops and the priests, and we put those down there. <laughs> 
But uh, yeah, anyways, especially in the West, that's what happened. In the West, you really had this tradition of showing, uh, of showing only you know, kings and, uh, and bishops and priests and monks in hell. And, and normal people, yeah, they don't go to hell. You know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What do the words on the scrolls for the angels say? I don't know. I was trying to figure it out. I couldn't, I couldn't find what was written. But I think it, it probably has to, it, I would think that it would be the words of Christ saying, enter into my kingdom on one side, and then, you know, yeah, depart from me. I think that's what it is, but I couldn't, I couldn't read the, I tried to read them, I couldn't. Um, that gives you an idea of this, this icon, yeah? I, maybe I missed, did I answer your question, or did I miss, kind of miss your question? Yeah, go ahead, go ahead again. The Last Judgment, and, yeah. and the, sort of the assumption there is that everything on the left, is, it's, it's fallen, it's going to be consumed, yeah. it's, it's the chaff uh, that's separated out. But yet, there seems to be a promise, a hope, right? The desert and the flood led to renewal. You've got the, the resurrection from the tombs, the, yeah. the redemption from the passions that swallowed the... So is there some seed of hope that's built into this? And, and, and Why, I, I think, no, I think, I think there definitely is. I mean, there definitely is, in, like for us, there definitely is a seed of hope that that, that which pulls us on the left side, or that which pulls us into fragmentation, into death, we can be saved from that, obviously. Uh, but I, we have to be careful about, we have to be careful, like down there, like down there I would say that, that, it, it, that all, all abandon all hope, you, and, you know, like Dante, Dante put that quote up there. And I think that, I think that, that what, what exactly that entails, like we don't know what exactly that entails. But I think that part of the Christian tradition, there is really this idea that, that, the, that there really, really is this, this possibility of, of, of losing yourself. And I think that that's important. Um, you know, and yeah, I think it's important that it is possible to, to totally lose yourself and to, that there is no way back. Um, but it, you know, yeah. So one final thing on yeah. that. Is, so is this... Is this, you, you mentioned this is sort of a reflection of reality. So is this yeah. what's going on within us now, this, yeah. this terror, but also the final thing that happens? I think so. Yeah. I, that's, that's how I, that's definitely how I see it. But I also see also, I also see the, that, that, that last judgment as the, the finality of all, like of all of us. But we can, like I said, it's, it's still now, right? It's, that, it's also now, yeah. And I think that there's nothing, this is absolutely orthodox to say that because that's why our liturgy is the way it is. That's why in our liturgy we are already in the kingdom. That's why we are already in the resurrection. We are participating in the resurrection when we, when we take the sacraments. And so it really, it's really there. It's part of our, of our but obviously it's, it's mysterious because there really is this, also this notion that there is a cosmic finality into, into which everything will be transparent. Yes, Father. Could the left section be like purgatory? I mean, where in a sense people are being... Maybe. I'll, I'll, let me show you. I'll show you a different... I wasn't necessarily going to show you this, but I'll show it to you. <laughs> oh, boy. Here we go. And I might get in trouble for this. I'm telling you. Um, so, <laughs> in some images of the Last Judgment, uh, you will see a big snake. So you'll see this giant snake, which is swerving down. Depends, not always exactly the same. In this one, he's biting the heel of Adam, and the snake is swerving down, down into the fire. Um, and along the snake, there are these nodes. Okay. Shoots and ladders. That's right. <laughs> it's, that's exactly what it is. It's exactly shoots and ladders. And on the snake, just like we saw on the ladder of divine ascent, there are angels, right? And the angels are helping people up the snake. And then there are demons that are pulling people down the snake. So it's exactly shoots and ladders. Um, and that, let me see if I have another image of this. Here's another one. 
All right, so here we see it more clearly because you can see the angel, the angel, then the demons at each node, okay? And those, those nodes are what people call the toll houses. Um, and uh, the, the, it's very controversial in the Orthodox Church. I'm telling you right now, I'm not, I'm not, not taking one side or the other, but I can explain to you what it is. Uh, and the toll houses are this process, are the process of judgment of the person, you could say. They're just like the latter. There are these different nodes, and each node represents a sin and a virtue. And then the, the, the story is that the soul ascends these nodes, and at each step is, there's an angel and a demon, just like all the others. And, and, and if you pass, you go up, and if you don't, you stay there. Right? And so it, it is the, the very process of sanctification. And so I think also in the, the toll houses, it's important to, to understand also that although we see it as happening after death, it's the same as the latter. It's the same thing. It's happening now, right? It's, it, it's, it's also happening now. Um, and so that's the, this image of this, this snake. But when you said chutes and ladders, it's like there's, you couldn't have had a better, a better image. It's a chute and a ladder at the same time, the same thing. Because in a sense, I mean, the fact that God has allowed the devil and his demons to be around, they have a role in the economy of salvation. I mean, in a sense, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm tying that to the snake yeah. here. You know, they have a role. I mean, we're meant to be tempted. We can't grow yeah. unless we actually overcome. You know, unless we fight temptation, unless we're sanctified, you know, as you say, unless we receive the graces and go up against our passions. Or right. And we become, and I think that's really important to understand, is that as, as we ascend, as we, as we ascend the ladder, then we become what's at that ladder. It's not just a question of, of arbitrary judgment or arbitrary or like you did this and you didn't do this. It's, it's to become something. It's to acquire a virtue. And, so, and as you acquire virtue, then you become that which is at that level, right? And, and, and you become more and more in the image of God, right? So it's a, it's, it's a process of transformation of the person. It's not just a bunch of rules you have to follow in order to go to heaven or to go to hell. It, it's, that's, not, that's not it. It's to become something. And what you become, that's paradise itself, right? To acquire the virtue is paradise. There's nothing else, right? That's what it is, to become something. And to enter to paradise is to become that which is in paradise, is to be in the holy place, to have to be in, in, a, in a place in yourself and in your, in your life where you can, are transparent to God, that, you, that God flows through you and you have nothing holding it back, okay? Uh, and I think that's really important to, uh, to, uh, to understand. One, one last thing I want to show you about this one, sorry, these ones, is here you really get, when I told you about this right hand and left hand, and some of these icons, you get it like a, you know, like, like a, it's, it's almost like a going up and going, like an elevator and a shoot, you know. So on one, one side, you have these saints that are ascending on the right side. They're going up on the right side of, of Christ. And then on the left side, you have all these demons that are falling down into the fire. So you have this ladder, right, and all these nodes, and then the, the, the ascension and the descent on the other side. Right? And so it's really, it's an image of, like I told you, it's an image of reality. It's an image of the, the, the hierarchy of the world. It's an image of the, 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 the ontological hierarchy of reality. All right, so I think, I mean, I think I've kind of gone through the icon. There, there are, like, there are variations, and I'm not going to go through all the variations, because really there are all kinds of, of variations on this image. I kind of gave you a basic structure of what this icon looks like, and then you can, you can then explore what... You know, like in this image, for example, you, you, have, you don't have the, um, the dead people getting, getting uh, thrown up by animals. But you have the same images here. You have this gray mass, and you have all these people inside, and you have the angels that are calling with trumpets. And so it also is this raise, being raised up out of death that's happening. And here it's, it's, it's been put into contrast directly with the mother of God as an image of paradise. So you have these two sides, uh, you know, opposing each other. 
If you enjoyed this content and our exploration of symbolism, get involved. I love to read your comments in the comments section below. Please go ahead and share this on social media to all your friends. And also, please consider supporting us financially on Patreon. You'll find the link to the Patreon page in the description below.